Hello, welcome to Musing Heavy, the site devoted to alternative reflections on hard rock and heavy metal. My name is Stephen Meyer, and today we're going to look at a portion of my essay that I put together a short time ago called, Is Conflict Needed for Great Heavy Music? Considering the Cases of Aerosmith, UFO, and Yunwei Malmsteen. As always, the link is provided below if you want to read the entire text version. Okay. So this particular episode, actually part two of five, uh, based on this essay, uh, we're going to look specifically at Aerosmith. And Aerosmith provides actually a really great case in point for this overall theme that I'm looking at in this paper, in that there's a lot of people that hold the notion that Aerosmith's best material or their best era occurred because of conflict, because they were in a state of turmoil, right? I'm going to largely refute that argument. All right. In fact, I'm going to put forward what I think are two, at least two, much better uh, reasons as to why Aerosmith's output has changed through the years. I'm not going to say better or worse because that's up to the year of the beholder, but definitely has changed through the years. Right. But before I get to those arguments, I'm going to set this argument up, argument up a little more precisely. And in so doing, what we're going to do is have a look at their briefly look at Aerosmith's catalog and sort of allocate which albums were produced when, say, the band was in conflict and which albums were produced when they were at relative peace. Um, and that'll kind of put everybody on equal footing. I know a lot of people are very familiar with Aerosmith's catalog, but there might be some folks that aren't or at least don't know parts of it that well. And I'll also point out some of the most popular songs on each of the albums to give people even you know better markers for all of this. All right. So. Let's share our screen a little bit here. Okay, so here we are. And I'll go down to the Aerosmith part. And actually, we're going to shift over real quick to look at, I've developed a little, a little figure we're going to look at. But so when and why was Aerosmith great? So the folklore we're going to explore, and as I say, I'm largely going to refute, is the idea that clean Happy Aerosmith equals inferior Aerosmith. Or if you like, when the band was at a, in a lot of turmoil, that created their best output. Not really buying that. So again, let's, let's provide that overview and I'll get into some of the arguments as to which I think are better explainers of all of this. Okay, so here's Aerosmith's discography. Um, you know, actually, for a band that's been around as long as Aerosmith, they don't really have that many albums. And I'm really just I'm just considering studio albums, so not compilations, greatest hits, live albums, things like that. So just their studio albums. Um, OK, so for starters, what I've done is I've broken up Aerosmith's career into three main categories, three eras, if you like. So the widely acknowledged classic era. Right. And I'll describe this in a little more detail in a second. But this is the early stuff from 1973 to 1979. This is also when Aerosmith was at their most conflicted, particularly as we get into the latter part of this period. Right. Where there was a lot of in band fighting, a lot of drug use. This is when Steven Tyler and Joe Perry were coined the toxic twins and all that sort of stuff, which has become kind of famous. Um, and just quickly too, Steven Tyler, the vocalist. Joe Perry, lead guitarist, rhythm guitarist, Brad Whitford, lead guitarist, rhythm guitarist, Tom, Ham Tom Hamilton, the bass player, and jo Joey Kramer, the drummer. The original band has been intact for virtually their entire career, which also makes Aerosmith quite, quite remarkable in that regard. Okay, so here is the early era. It's widely acknowledged as the classic era. For many people, this will be their favorite stuff. Certainly long, a lot of longtime fans will say that. But it's also when the band was at their most conflicted, again, especially once we get to some of these later albums, which we'll get to. There's a transitional era that goes from 1982 to 1985. I'm calling these albums transitional for reasons I'll get into, right? And we also have the commercially successful but controversial era, right? So this is the latest output from Aerosmith, which runs from 1987 to 2012, actually runs right up to the present because the band is still together and still planning the tour as of 2022. But I'm capping this at, at 2012 because Music from Another Dimension was actually the last studio album we've gotten from Aerosmith, okay? this I'm calling this commercially successful but current uh, controversial. There's no question 
Aerosmith sold a boatload of albums, especially early in this era. Like these were wildly successful albums. And even, even some of the more recent ones have sold quite well too, or download a lot and streamed a lot still, right? But it's controversial because a lot of longtime fans seem to have a problem with this era, right? It's too poppy. It's too commercial. It's also significantly for our discussion on this, this is also a happier, more cleaned up Aerosmith for the most part of this era. In other words, they're more or less off the drugs. There's not near the infighting going on. And again, this is what leads some people to say, we'll see what happens when Aerosmith gets happy. They're not as good, right? Well, again, that's an argument that I'm going to kind of beat up a little bit. Okay. Let's, again, I'll quickly go through the discography because, again, I know a lot of people know Aerosmith, but for those who aren't as familiar, so we've got the first album, Aerosmith, a, 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 a very bluesy hard rock, I would say, generally hard rocking for sure, but definitely there's a blues influence. Uh, no doubt everybody has heard of Dream On, so that comes from this album, arguably maybe still their signature song to this day, so that's certainly one of the big ones, maybe the biggest one. Uh, maybe in this entire era, perhaps, but there's a lot of them. So you're going to know a lot of these songs, even if you're not a fan. Uh, Mama Kin, also a fairly well-known hard rocker. Maybe their take on Walking the Dog is also fairly popular from their first album. That indeed is a cover. Um, but by the time we get to the second album, you know, still blues, blues influence, maybe leaning a little towards heavy metal. I mean, you know, certainly still hard rock. And I don't know if Aerosmith ever really was heavy metal, but this maybe rocks a little harder in some ways, get your wings. A lot, a lot of longtime fans will point to this album as one of their favorites for sure. Um, Train Kept a Rollin', another cover actually might be the most famous song from this album. And I think they still play that pretty routinely all through their career in, in concert. Uh, same old song and dance is on this too. And I think that's a fairly popular song, right? And then we get to toys in the attic. This is hands down their most successful album, like at least commercially it's sold the most. Um, and it, you might argue it's their all round most successful in terms, certainly in terms of sales, but also it's, it's probably in a lot of ways, one of their most critically acclaimed albums too. It seems to check off all the boxes, right? Um, and it has a ton of hits on here. So Walk This Way is from this album. Um, Sweet Emotion is from this album. Two of their absolute monster hits, really. The title track is very well known, Toys in the Attic. Um, what else? Uncle Salty, again, a fairly well known song. Their version of Big Ten Inch has also become quite popular. No More, No More. Really, almost every song in the album is really well known, right? And, and, for as, as accessible as Toys in the Attic is, it still rocks pretty darn hard, right? So like I say, it seems to kind of satisfy everybody. Um, then we get to their fourth album, Rocks. Um, I would argue, and I think a lot of people would probably agree with this, this probably is their heaviest album. Um, this, is the, this is a great example of where Aerosmith edges right up to that boundary of heavy metal. I mean, you know, hard rock, the hardest of hard rock and heavy metal are sometimes not that far apart rocks might be a great example of a band that's really right right on that right on that margin right um best known songs would definitely be i think back in the saddle and last child but like i say there are some really heavy songs on this album rats in the cellar combination nobody's fault licking a promise sick as a dog like these these are pretty close to heavy metal if in fact they might actually be heavy metal and i mean this is pretty early like what are we talking 76 at this point so pretty hard rock and pretty heavy for the time um then we get to their fifth album draw the line now i should also point out too um as far as drug use and conflict and turmoil it's really a slippery slope as the especially once we get to rocks and beyond the band is really starting to really starting to you know, exist under an avalanche of drugs. And again, this is no secret. The band has been very open about their problems, the turmoil, et cetera. I mean, it's in books. You, you hear they still talk about it all the time. Uh, the drug use is maybe at epic proportions by the time we get to draw the line. I um, always love this cartoon version of them. I think that's kind of iconic. Draw the Line's an interesting album in that it's a bit of a left turn, you know, where I would say, get your wings, Toys in the Attic rocks are, are you know, edging up to heavy metal. This one probably doesn't. This one's sort of more, I, I always hear it as almost a little more similar to the first album. There's a lot more blues influence on Draw the Line. 
Um, nevertheless, a couple really like the song Draw the Line is, is really, you know, really well known, I think. Kings and Queens is on this album, too. So that one is also, you know, well known. Uh, the last album of this widely acknowledged classic era, maybe not everyone would include Night in the Ruts on here, but I, I'm certainly, I think a lot of longtime Aerosmith fans have a certain fondness for this album, even if it's not quite as well known as maybe the previous five. Um, also quite bluesy. Um, probably the best known song would be Remember Walking in the Sand, which actually is a cover. Um, what else? No surprise, maybe is known reasonably well. Um, and again, the band is really falling apart at this point, right? Like really from rocks to draw the line, the night in the ruts, and maybe even some evidence even before, like, cause the drug use has always been pretty epic, but it really reaches, I would say scary proportions when we get to this point and it actually fractures the band, right? So when we get into the transitional era, we get to rock in a hard place. Well, actually it, this is the one and only album where it doesn't have all original members. Joel Perry and Brad Whitford, the guitar players, are out at this point. Um, but they still managed to produce a reasonably typical Aerosmith album, maybe a bit of a dark horse in the catalog. Again, I think there's a lot of longtime fans that probably do like this album, and it's pretty heavy. Bluesy as well, but, but still pretty heavy. Uh, Lightning Strikes is probably the one song that has had some longevity. Most of the other songs on this album are really just, it's going to be deep Aerosmith fans are going to know this. Um, and again, I call it a transitional album because in this case, um, we don't have all original members. And then when we get to Aerosmith done with what uh, done with mirrors, I call this transitional because it is actually a reunion album. But the funny thing about this album, it's this, this is another album that's almost forgotten. Right. Again, unless you're kind of a deep fan, a lot of a lot of people might not even know this album exists. Right. But it is the true reunion album. Joe Perry and Brad Whitford come back. And the original band is back together and have been ever since. A lot of people sort of think Permanent Vacation was the reunion album, and probably for good reason, because this album was just, just such a monster commercially. But Done With Mirrors, again, kind of came and went with a kind of just a bit of a whimper. There aren't really any big, although I, I still think there's a lot of great songs in this album, but there are none that, are, that would be considered big hits. Maybe let the music do the talking, um, which actually was an old Joe Perry project. So the solo uh, uh, project Joe had when he was out of Aerosmith and actually still has a little bit to these, this day. Uh, but they do a remake of that song where Steven Tyler adds a few more lyrics on it. But really, it's not a well-known album. But when we get into the last era of Aerosmith, so the commercially successful but controversial era, they've cleaned up. All right. The drug use is gone. Steven Tyler has had a couple relapses in the pain pills, so that aside, but generally speaking, they've cleaned up, they're living much better, they're not fighting each other, there isn't the tension, there isn't all the turmoil in the band, right? And, it, and at least for the first part of this era, hey man, it was commercially successful like crazy, like Permanent Vacation, Pump and Get a Grip, incredibly successful albums. Again, you might not like them that much, depending on which era of Aerosmith you like, but there's no denying how, how many people actually do, uh, given the sales, right? Like only Toys in the Attic has sold more than these three albums, right? Um, so Permanent Vacation, again, there's some hard rockers on it for sure, but I think this album, as all of these albums, are driven by more of the power ballads and maybe the hooky, funky, sort of poppy songs, right? So the songs you no doubt will know, and maybe you like them, maybe you don't, but Angel, Power Ballad, which really was the blueprint for a whole lot of power ballads that were coming up, right? Dude Looks Like a Lady is on this album as well. Again, not really hard rock at all. It's pop, funky kind of stuff. Ragdoll is on here too. Those would be, I mean, there's a lot of big songs in this album, but those would be the three smashes, if you like. Um, same for Pump. I mean, Pump, Pump probably rocks a little harder than Permanent Vacation. And I guess if I had to pick a favorite from this era, it probably would be Pump. I actually do quite like this album. I'll, my bias is, again, I, I'm really partial to the early stuff. But I, but I, there's a lot of the stuff in this era that I, you know, I don't, I don't think is terrible. And I actually think Pump's a pretty good album. Um, but having said that, Pump. You know, the catalyst for Pump is definitely the hits, and the hits really ain't all that heavy, bottom line. Uh, Janie's Got a Gun is from that album. Again, probably a likable sort of ballad. I guess it's okay, right? But it's certainly not what you call hard rock or heavy metal. Loving an Elevator, 
probably another huge, well, it is another huge hit for the band. Not one of my favorites, but obviously a lot of people like it. What It Takes, another power ballad that has had a lot of legs over the years too. And then we get to Get a Grip, monster album. Again, in terms of sales, whether you like it or a lot, hard to say. A couple of hard rockers in there. Eat the Rich is a really hard rocker that I think gets played quite a bit. And I, I quite like that song myself. Uh, Joe Perry's Walk On Down is excellent. Really great song. But again, this album is riding on the success of the power ballads. Okay, we got Living on the Edge, massive song. It's okay as far as power ballads go, I guess. But then they, 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 out, for me, at least, they start wearing me out, you know, amazing, crying, crazy. They're, you know, we're, we're really got a formula going on here, I would say, right? But hey, lots of people love this stuff. So I'm not telling you it's bad or anything. But certainly, again, it's, it's the non hard rock or pseudo metal that's not, that isn't driving these albums. It's the other stuff that's definitely driving. And then by the time we get to Nine Lives, okay, commercially, these last three have not been as successful, but hey, it's relative, right? This is still Aerosmith. This is still one of the biggest bands on the planet. And these albums still did good business and still, I'm sure, get lots of downloads and streams, even though they're not quite at par with these and maybe some of the early stuff. It's still big business, right? This is still Aerosmith. So Nine Lives, again, you know, things are staying pretty poppy, pretty safe, Um you know, falling in love is hard on the knees. That song, right? That's that's again the power ballad. Is I mean, it, it, they're still selling a gazillion albums because of that formula. Uh, just push play. Jaded, jaded was another power ballad, right? Music from another dimension. Uh, I don't know that there is really any big hit from this one. Uh, certainly, the sales tailed off. Um, some people think the problem with this album and perhaps even these all three is that Aerosmith's just trying to please everybody. They got a few hard rockers on there. They got all kinds of power ballads, of course. They got a few funky pop songs and maybe by trying to please everybody, they're sort of not really pleasing anyone. I don't know. Depends on how you look at it. But anyway, so there's kind of the run through. So again, keeping in mind though, for our argument here, this is uh, the widely acknowledged classic era, but band very much in conflict. Okay. Sort of transitional, still kind of conflict here, made up. Everybody's happy at this point, but for whatever reason, this album never got traction. And again, here for the most part, the drugs are gone. Much of the conflict's gone, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's controversial because lots of people don't really like this era, especially if a lot of longtime fans who have more, maybe a hard rock metal sort of leaning to them. Me personally, like I say, I don't, I, I think this era is okay, right? But I certainly prefer the other stuff too. But my bias is heavy metal and hard rock. So you'd probably expect that. There's lots of people who probably got onto the Aerosmith train around permanent vacation or pump, right? And, and probably have a strong, I'm going to make the argument, would still probably have a strong appreciation for the 70s stuff, but probably love, love this stuff to death, right? So it just depends on where you stand. Anyway, okay, so there we go. Let's move on here. Back to the essay. Okay, so I've kind of gone through the, the overview. You sort of see where things sit and where they when they were conflicted and what albums were being produced when they were conflicted and vice versa, right? Okay, so yet is it really defendable to hold the position that the band's greatness as exemplified by many by the 1970s albums was unrepeatable so long as relative calm was existing in the Aerosmith camp, like a lot of people seem to assume, right? Applying the conflict and great art causation correlation proposition, which I actually developed more precisely in part one, if you want to check that out, to the Aerosmith situation is highly problematic for reasons I will outline below. So again, I'm not really buying the idea Right, that the reason, say, that 70s stuff was just so awesome was because the band was falling apart, right? That that's, you know, indeed, the, the band may have been falling apart, but I don't, that's not the reason why that stuff was so awesome, at least as far as I'm concerned. There's other reasons that'll explain that better. Or conversely, why the 1980s highly commercial but controversial era, why many people, ah, I don't think this stuff is as good, they're, and it's because they're happy, so there's your reason. I don't think that explains anything either. I think there's better reasons for this, and we're going to get into that. And 
so there's two main reasons why I'm going to, I'll make these, these, these arguments. And the first one is outside influences. You can't downplay how important that's been. And, and we're going to look at some actual numbers. I actually crunched a few numbers here to try to sort of beef this argument up a bit. Okay. For a band that has spanned almost 50 years, that's how long they've been around, right? It's quite remarkable that all of its original members have remained involved for almost the entire duration. So as I was saying, there's only a couple exceptions. On the one album, Rock in a Hard Place, there were replacement guitarists. Well, at the time, I guess we thought they were permanent, but they turned out to be replacement guitarists. Uh, Jimmy Crespo and Rick DeFay, who replaced Joe Perry and Brad Whitford. And yes, there has been occasionally, not on albums, but on tours, there have been some drummer stand-ins for Joey Kramer when he was ill or injured. So there have been the odd, but, but generally speaking, the band has been remarkably consistent with having original members all the way through. And that doesn't happen very often, right? And that's really important for the Aerosmith, again, in this argument I'm trying to make, because for a lot of people, it's like, you know, okay, so for some bands, the reason they might their musical styles might change over the years is because they've had membership changes, right? Kind of makes sense. If you lose a key member and bring in a new person who's maybe, you know, very, very strong in songwriting or whatever, that inevitably will change the style of the band, right? Well, you can't say that for Aerosmith, right? It's basically been the same band with a couple exceptions all the way through, right? So again, that, that gives, I think, even more fodder to people who think, you know, want to buy into this, well, conflict creates great art because they'll say, well, look, Aerosmith was so great when they were in turmoil, but they weren't as good when they were happy and we can't blame it on membership change. So what else can it be? Well, I think there are other things. And to me, the impact of producers, outside writers, and an increasing willingness to appeal to more mainstream audiences have been far more significant. And I would argue goes a long way to explaining why cleaned up Aerosmith sounds so different to many the, in comparison to the more conflicted Aerosmith. OK, in fact, I think influ outside influences on Aerosmith have been so profound that any proclaimed impact on the band's collective state of mind and the, the quality of the art. I think that's basically we can almost ignore it. I don't think it has anything to do with it. Right. OK. Just to set this argument up, but just a little bit, longtime Aerosmith fans will know all about this, but just to sort of set it up. Um, I think it's pretty clear. Who is Aerosmith's creative center? Well, to a large degree, I think you'd have to say it's Steven Tyler, right? Not only does he have one of the most recognizable voices in all of, all of rock, um, and he's an amazing showman, amazing frontman as well. He is a, he is a gifted songwriter. And, and again, you, anybody can look this stuff up. And really what I did was I just, I looked at the writing credits for all their songs and you can see Steven Tyler is all over the place, right? The majority of Aerosmith's songs, Steven Tyler either writes or has a co-write. Now, often he co-writes with Joe Perry. So Joe Perry is immensely important to the creative process of Aerosmith as well. There's a lot of songs, Tyler Perry, Tyler Perry, right? That's, that's pretty common. Um, now, the other band members have certainly been important, too. The whole band writes, you know. Um, you'll see writing credits. Tom Hamilton, the bassist, has certainly co-written lots of songs with Steven Tyler, as has Brad Whitford, occasionally even Joey Kramer, right? But the lion's share has involved Steven Tyler and or Steven Tyler and Joe Perry, okay? Um, another thing to keep in mind, and that's especially evident in the early Aerosmith, but that does really carry through through their career. Tyler and Tyler Perry have been sort of key in a lot of ways, right? Um, an another thing we should note, in the early days of Aerosmith, so that, that first six albums that we were talking about, there was a big influence by producer Jack Douglas. In fact, he produced four of six of their, their biggest albums, really, right? In, in, the, in the early era, and then he produced some others later, too. But that early era is Jack Douglas' big, big influence on the band. Right. So that's important to remember, too. OK, so for the sake of comparison, I tabulated the writing credits on Aerosmith's albums to have a look at um, the influence of who was doing the writing. Was it just Steven Tyler and Steven Tyler and Joe Perry, for instance, or were there a lot of outside writers? And we're going to see there's a really profound shift that occurs around the happy, clean Aerosmith time. So let's just go back to our little diagram real quick here. You may have noticed. At the bottom of each of these, I've put um, percent of outside writers, okay? 
And this is really cool. I, I, I was even shocked at how much the numbers worked out here. Um, okay, so what I did, so for the first era, for instance, there's six albums, right? And of these six albums, there are 45 total songs. Now, what I did, though, is I did subtract the number of songs that were covers, right? Because that, that doesn't count. There weren't songs written by the band for that album. There's songs that Aerosmith is just doing their version of. So things like Walking the Dog, right, and Big Ten Inch, et cetera, wouldn't be counted here, right? So we've got a total of 45 songs from the first six albums that aren't covers, that are essentially new songs for that album, okay? Well, here's what's interesting. Only seven of those 45 songs have a co-writer that's outside the band, that I eat. A writer who's not Steven Tyler, Joe Perry, Brad Whitford, Tom Hamilton, or Joey Kramer. Okay. So roughly just under 16% of the songs have an outside writer. Now, here's one other quick thing I'll mention. Um, most of these seven songs, in fact, four of them come from just one album, Draw the Line. And it's also important to note the co-writer, outside writer, if you even want to call him that, was Jack Douglas. Okay. The producer. Now, you could make an argument he's not really an outside writer because Jack produced this one, this one, this one. this. In a lot of ways, you could almost say Jack Douglas was sort of a sixth member of the band anyway, as a lot of producers are, right? Um, so was he truly an outside writer, at least in terms of the studio, was he truly an outside writer? You could probably argue he kind of wasn't. But even if you put in the, 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 the handful of songs that Jack Douglas did co-write, it's still only seven of 45. So the lion's share, you know, 85% of the songs from this era are written by the band themselves. And a lot of that Steven Tyler and Joe Perry. Okay. How about the transitional era? Same idea. So from these two albums, there are 18 total songs minus a couple covers. And only three of those songs are, are have a co-write either written in total or co-written by somebody outside the band. So again, roughly the same proportion, right? We're roughly at about, you know, this one's at maybe close to 17%. This one's at 16%, say. Okay, now check this out. When we get to the cleaned up, happy Aerosmith that some people like to blame, that's why the output's so different. Uh, I think this has a lot to do with why the output's so different. Check this out. 54 of 74 songs, so a total of 74 songs from, from these, these six albums, again, not counting covers, 54 of them have an outside writer. So it's Steven Tyler, Joe Perry, and Desmond Child, right? Um, so, uh, so we've got roughly three quarters of all the songs written here have an outside influence, right? That to me is massive. Oh, and by the way, there is another studio album in here. It's called Honkin' on Bobo. It actually was released after Just Push Play, but it's all covers, right? So I decided not to include it here because it's not really what I'm talking about, okay? But check out, big difference, right? I mean, outside writers, the, 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 the two earliest eras, not much influence at all. It's the band that's writing their material. When we get to the latest era, huge impact. I mean, there's a couple albums here where they write virtually, there's a co-outside writer on virtually every song on the album, right? Okay, so that, that has to have an impact at some point, right? Okay, so let's go back to the essay. Um, okay, oh yeah, another thing I really want to point out. These weren't just, uh, you know, run-of-the-mill outside writers, if I can put it that way. Like it wasn't a case where, you know, Steven Tyler and Joe Perry were jamming with their friends and say, oh, OK, you helped us. That song we're going to be a credit, you know, or something like that. No, these were song doctors. OK, people who were brought in to make the songs poppy commercial to sweeten them up. Right. The fact that these outside writers are high profile song doctors typically brought in to sweeten the songs for mass appeal. This is highly relevant. OK, so in this latter period of Aerosmith, where they're happy and they're not conflicted, they're bringing in song doctors. They're bringing in people to deliberately make them more commercial. They're not bringing in people like Desmond Child, J Jim Valance, Mark Hudson or Marty Fredrickson. They're not bringing these song who actually have written a lot of poppy hits for all kinds of other bands. Right. They're not bringing them in to make them sound heavier or to make them sound bluesier, or to make them sound, you know, more rootsier, like back to the old album. No, they're bringing them in to be, to reach wider audiences, essentially, of pop, right? So when you take in 
uh, that they brought in all these song doctors and then they're working with, you know, pop friendly producers such as Bruce Fairburn, right? Jack Douglas doesn't produce the later, the latter day albums. It's, they've got poppy producers in there too. It couldn't help but to shove or torque Aerosmith towards the mainstream. It had to happen, right? Whether they were cleaned up or not, I mean, doesn't matter. This was going to push them more mainstream and it was going to change their sound, right? And so you might think, well, did Aerosmith, did they go into this kicking and screaming, right? It's, ah, how, how dare the record company force us into this? I think quite the opposite. I think, I think this was totally calculated, especially on the part of Steven Tyler, who, let's face it, has pretty much set, set the pace for this band all the way through, right? Um, Steven Tyler was definitely wanting to be more of a commercial entity, right? I mean, look no further than his tenure on American Idol, right? Why else would he be doing that? I mean, I love Steven Tyler. He's one of my all-time favorites, but I admit, I couldn't watch that, right? It was sort of like, I don't even want to know that you're on American Idol. I just don't want to know, right? And then he did this pop country solo album. I don't even want to talk about that, right? So, I mean... Steven Tyler was definitely going in that direction, right? So this was, you know, I, I get this feeling really that nothing really happens at Aerosmith that Tyler doesn't want to happen anyway, right? So the fact that they brought in these song doctors were moving in a popular direction, right? Uh, at least as far as the hits. Like I said, those later albums still have their share of hard rockers, but it's the hits that were driving those albums, right? So the fact that they're bringing in these, these song doctors and they got producers that are pop guys and all that, Hey, I think that's exactly in Steven Tyler's wheelhouse at the time because, you know, he was trying to market himself as a pop guy as much as a hard rock guy. I think that's pretty clear. Now, admittedly, not everybody in the band seemed super happy about this. I mean, I remember reading lots of sort of half-hearted grumbles from especially Joe Perry, but also Brad Whitford. They're not loving this direction completely, but it certainly wasn't enough to, to tear the band apart or to cause major friction like had happened in previous years. In fact, I'm reminded, you know, I'm a longtime fan, right? I've kind of grown up with Aerosmith, and I really love Joe Perry, too. He's one of my heroes as well, right? So I always kept track of what Joe was saying over the years, and it always struck me, like, especially when we're in that era where they're getting popular, permanent vacation, pump, nine lives, all that stuff, right? And I always remember reading stuff from Joe, like when they're working on an album in that era, right? To say they got the demos and they're jamming out songs, and Joe would be doing interviews and going, you know what? The new, the new stuff sounded really heavy, really hard rocking. It's like we're going back to our roots, right? And then by the time you actually buy the album, it's like, Joe, I'm not really hearing that. This is pretty darn poppy. Something's happening in between, right? Um, it always reminded me sort of a stupid little, little thing in my head here. But for all you SCTV fans, if you remember Count Floyd, and Count Floyd used to always, you know, it was monster chiller horror theater or something like that. And he'd always be, he'd be this guy who would sort of build up this so-called scary movie before they would air it, right? So he'd be, oh, kids, this is going to be so scary. You're not going to be able to stand it. And then they'd play the movie. Of course, it wasn't scary at all, right? That kind of reminded me with Joe. Joe, oh, kids, this is going to be so heavy. You won't believe it. And you listen to it. Ah, Joe, it's not that heavy. anyway. You know, you get what I'm saying. But that, that's how it was always. I'm all, I'm all built up. Okay, finally, something that's going to sound like rocks. Uh, not really. Anyway. So, okay. So, so it's, here, here's, here's, you know, we'll move back into my essay here a little bit. Um, so it would be misleading to state that Aerosmith completely abandoned hard blues influenced uh, rock say after done with mirrors right so again like i say there was always a few rockers in there maybe to keep joe kind of happy maybe to throw a bone to the longtime fans i'm not sure right but i think we have to agree what was pushing those albums forward in the latter period was definitely the power ballads just those songs i was running through crazy amazing genie's got a gun angel i mean that's what was selling those albums right so here i guess here's my point where is the evidence that the stylistic change was caused by a happier Aerosmith, right? That was no longer fueled by drugs and terrible infighting in the band. If there's any evidence of it, I sure don't see it. I think the Son Doctors and Steven Tyler's want to be a pop idol, essentially. I think that was what was driving the switch, right? And that's probably the reason why you're never going to get an album like Draw the Line again. Not because they're cleaned up, but because they're in a totally different direction in terms of wanting to conquer those pop markets as much as the hard rock, hard rock markets. Okay. All right. Here's the second. 
the, se- the, the second of the two main arguments I'm making as to why cleaned up Aerosmith sounds quite different from conflicted Aerosmith, right? And that, again, by using these terms, they're actually kind of red herrings. Okay. There's this concept. I'm sure I didn't invent it. I'm sure other people have talked about this, but I, I guess I've never seen anybody kind of do it in this type of format. So I'm calling it this limited, extraordinarily innovative period. That just rolls right off the tongue, doesn't it? Okay, so what, what am I talking about here? Okay. Well, a band as important as Aerosmith is going to have a wide range of admirers, and they do, right? I mean, their fan profile is certainly just not going to be hard rocker metal heads like me, right? It, 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 you know, they're going to have all kinds of fans. They're going to have pop fans. They're going to have all kinds of people, even dance. People who like dance might even listen to Aerosmith. Who knows what? Because they are kind of groovy. They, they, do, they do have a bit of a groove, even to their heavy songs, right? But having said that, I think it's also safe to say that the people who had the biggest problem with their direction, right, that didn't like Nine Lives, didn't like just pr- press play, even didn't like pump all that, were likely to be the hard rockers and the metal people, if they even hunt around that long. Right. But here's the point. Strong sales relative to pretty much any other American rock band indicate that droves of music fans were finding something to like about any any of Aerosmith's albums. So even if they lost a few of the rockers later on, they gained all kinds of people who maybe just love their poppy songs, which is totally fair enough. Right. Okay, so. That's not to say, though, so just because Permanent Vacation and Pump and Get a Grip were wildly successful, right, and commercially they were, there's no question, and there's lots of people who like them, maybe not all the hard rockers, but there's a lot of people who do, that doesn't mean that they were necessarily important, okay? So what I'm saying is here, that's not to say that all of Aerosmith's albums carry the same weight in terms of innovation and groundbreaking art, okay? I think you can make an argument that those 70s albums that Errol Smith put together were some of the most innovative hard rock that anybody put out. They were truly groundbreaking. They were foundational albums in the annals of hard rock and heavy metal, beyond a doubt. I don't think you can say that about Permanent Vacation, Pump, Get a Grip, Nine Life. They're successful albums. They're actually maybe even very good albums. But are they truly groundbreaking? You know, are they truly innovative? No. And I, and I think even Fans who like those albums maybe even better than the 70s stuff would probably acknowledge that, right? Okay, so regardless of the massive commercial success of, say, Pump or Get a Grip, right, Latter-day Aerosmith will never be universally acknowledged as important, merely successful. There's a difference. An album that's truly important in terms of being groundbreaking and an influence on other bands, all that stuff, versus an album that's just successful. Some albums are both, okay? I mean, in Aerosmith's uh, catalog, probably the best example would be Toys in the Attic. Toys in the Attic is still their biggest selling album, and it's, it's incredibly important as a groundbreaking, innovative album, right? It's foundational for so many people and so many artists that came after Aerosmith, right? Okay, so there's a difference between an album being important and being successful. Okay. So I really can't think of any hard rock or heavy metal band of significant longevity. Say a band that's been around a few decades, right? You got to, otherwise it's not a fair comparison. So I can't think of any band that produced truly innovative music for their entire career, right? I, I, I thought about this quite a bit. I can't. Rush might come the closest. That's the only band I could think of that maybe has produced album after album that's not just successful, but truly groundbreaking and innovative. But I, I, I'm not even going to go down that rabbit hole because I know there's a lot of people going to say, well, what about that 80s material with the Rush and all the synthesizer? And I don't like that. OK, you might not like it. I still think it's incredibly innovative. But anyway, I won't even say I think Rush comes the closest, but I honestly can't think of one band that produced album after album that was truly groundbreaking and truly innovative, okay? Lots of bands put out incredibly commercial, you know, commercially successful albums all the time, and they might have been great albums too, but were they truly innovative, okay? Okay, so if we consider hard rock bands with strong connections to the 70s, so I'm gonna give you a few examples of what I mean by this, this idea of limited, extraordinarily innovative period. And I think you can apply this to any band that's been around for a length of time, right? So we're going to kind of look at some examples 
generalize this a bit and then bring it back to Aerosmith and then sort of kind of tie this together. Okay, so here's what I'm saying. If we consider hard rock bands with strong connections to the 70s, most fans will be united in reciting the same specific albums, usually in sequence, that really made the band special and timeless. Okay, that's one of the important aspects of this. Any fan of say, well, let's get into it. I'll show you exactly what I mean. So take the example of Black Sabbath, right? I don't think there's a, well, I shouldn't say nobody, but it would, it would shock me to find if there would be more than a really small percentage of Black Sabbath fans who would not say that the earliest, their first six albums were groundbreaking, innovative, you know, some of the most important albums ever put out in hard rock and heavy metal. I think every Black Sabbath fan is going to say that. Right. So we're talking about Black Sabbath, Paranoid, Master of Reality, Volume 4, uh, Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath and Sabotage. OK. And I think it would be virtually unanimous. Right. That everyone's going to say these are incredibly important bedrock albums for heavy rock. Right. Now, here's the point. That doesn't mean that Black Sabbath hasn't put out some incredibly important albums and, and widely liked albums after that. You know, I mean, think, think no more than the Dio era. Of course. I mean, look at the albums they put out with Ronnie James Dio. They're, they're albums that people swear. I love those as well. Like even say the Tony Martin era, right? A lot of people are kind of getting on to the fact that that stuff was really great too, right? But my point is, even if you would say you like, say, the Ronnie James Dio era of Black Sabbath better, okay? And there are people out there that will say that, right? Those people will at least acknowledge how important the, seven, the early stuff was. But, I, but the reverse isn't true. There are lots of people with Black Sabbath who will say, you know what, after Ozzy left, I don't even care. It doesn't matter. It's not Black Sabbath. It doesn't matter, right? So you get my point? This is the extraordinarily innovative period of Black Sabbath that's limited, that, almost, that virtually everyone will agree on, okay? Again, it's not doesn't mean they haven't released some great albums after. It's just that everyone will agree how important, how innovative this was. Okay, I think you get the point. Alice Cooper. I mean, how many albums has Alice Cooper released? I don't know, about 700? Well, not quite that many, but a lot, right? Okay, but of all the albums Alice has released, and he's got a whole lot of great ones in my view, right? Everybody, I don't care what era of Alice Cooper you like the best, everyone is likely to acknowledge, really by the time Alice gets, the Alice Cooper group, I should say, it's not just Alice, uh, get to their third album, Love It to Death, Killer, Schools Out, and Billion Dollar Babies, right? So again, that is going to be, I would say pretty much universally accepted. That was the Alice Cooper band at their most innovative, right? They, I mean, they set the standard for shock rock in so many ways. Like, I mean, they, they were the Kings, right? I don't think anybody will dispute that, right? Even if maybe your favorite album by Alice Cooper is Welcome to My Nightmare or even Trash. I mean, that doesn't matter. That could be your favorite, but those folks are still at least going to acknowledge, oh yeah, these are the albums that are that are really innovative, right? Okay. Same with Deep Purple. Okay, I, I'll speed this up a bit because you're probably getting the point. Deep Purple had released a number of great albums before in rock, and they released a gazillion of great albums after Made in Japan. But this is the era, again, and it's usually a small era. This is where they were extraordinarily innovative, okay? In rock, Fireball, Machine Head, and Made in Japan, all right? I'll admit, Made in Japan might be a little controversial for some people because not everybody loves the live side of Deep Purple, which tends to get kind of lawn and jammy. But I would argue even those folks, even if you don't like live Deep Purple, you'll acknowledge how important Made in Japan was as a truly landmark uh, live album in hard rock. It might be the landmark album in hard rock, right? Live album, that is, right? Okay, so you sort of get... But um, Thin Lizzy, I mean, Thin Lizzy was actually fairly uh there there are quite a few albums into their career but i think their extraordinarily innovative period starts with jailbreak then johnny the fox bad reputation live and dangerous another incredibly important live album in black rose right budgie their extraordinarily innovative period that they could never really repeat again as none of the other bands could do is their first five albums bloister cult same deal their first what do i got their six albums i guess including, again, another incredibly important live album, On Your Feet and On Your Knees. Motorhead, same deal. Their first few, Motorhead, Overkill, Bomber, Ace of Spades, No Sleep to Hammersmith. Motorhead has released a gazillion great albums. I mean, I remember so many interviews with Lemmy. It almost, it's almost like you could see it was really bugging him 
when people would only ask them questions about ace of spades and maybe overkill, right? And it's like, man, we got a million other great or those, man, we got a lot of great albums, you know. But but again, I think he understood that this was the period that was universally agreed as the most innovative, the most important, even though they released a million other great albums. Okay, so you sort of get the point. So I'm not saying that these bands and other important artists of the 70s didn't craft some amazing gems before or after these core periods that I'm calling extraordinarily innovative, right? In fact, with respect to these seven examples, I personally like a few subsequent releases even better, right? I, I do, right? But I'm convinced that anyone who is a fan would acknowledge the importance of these albums and consensus would be virtually unanimous in that thinking. I believe it is possible to attach this limited, extraordinarily innovative period to any artist, right? Be it a musician, a painter, a poet, a writer, etc. In terms of hard rock and heavy metal, it is a time which almost defies description. The stars just align, you know, perfectly and the group's output is undeniably extraordinary right? And they're at their peak of importance. That's the key. Yet history has shown this period cannot be extended or repeated indefinitely. Like I say, no album, no band has ever done it. They, they've done it for their whole career. Maybe Rush, but that's it. I, and it, probably not even Rush, really. Sure, isolated albums may merge to reinvigorate the band to further greatness, like outside of this extraordinary period, right? And that typically occurs after significant membership change. I mean, again, Black Sabbath's Heaven and Hell, when Dio joined, an incredibly great album, right? Uh, or Deep Purple's Perpendicular. I think Steve Morris has done an incredible job with Deep Purple, right? But again, not everyone's going to agree with that, right? But everyone will agree on In Rock to Made in Japan, by and large, or everyone's going to agree on Sabbath's for six album. That's the difference, right? Okay, so none will rival the unquantifiable magic of the group at their most innovative and most influential. And importantly, albums produced during this magical period will be almost completely devoid of detractors in the fan base. Okay, so to wrap this up, bring it back to Aerosmith and why I think this explains so much why their style changed. Well, Aerosmith had their extraordinarily innovative period. And they've never been able to have it again because bands just don't, right? So for many Aerosmith enthusiasts, the run of albums that include the first five, basically, Aerosmith, Get Your Wings, Toys in the Attic, Rocks, and Draw the Line, will constitute, constitute the band's extraordinarily innovative period. And I would argue, even if you prefer latter-day Aerosmith, and let's face it, lots of people do, say Permanent Vacation or Pump, or maybe even Just Push Play are your favorites, right? My point is any Aerosmith band is likely to at least acknowledge the greatness of the band's 1970s innovative period, right? But the reverse is not true, right? There are many Aerosmith fans that will say, I don't like anything they've done after Night in the Ruts. I hate the new stuff, right? Or there might be fans kind of like me who tolerate Get a Grip, think it's okay, but it doesn't come close to when they were truly innovative, right? So. Therefore, expecting that Aerosmith could continue their run of undisputed classics that'll satisfy everyone in their fan base and that they're truly innovative, it's not going to happen. It's not realistic. So the fact that Aerosmith cleaned up and sorted out all their group-destroying demons does not explain why the mega-selling pump, for example, will never be as universally admired as Toys in the Attic. Right. This limited, um, extraordinary innovation period does explain that, I think. It has much more to do with the fact that Aerosmith moved out of their limited period of extraordinary innovation decades ago. And as has been the case with pretty much any band you can think of, will never be able to recapture such creative heights again. Right. That's it for part two. Join me for part three. And I'm going to continue this theme of looking at the potential connection, I guess you could say, between conflict and great art. And we're going to look at the example of British institution, uh, hard rock band UFO. Another great case in point for this. And yes, I'm going to talk a lot about guitar wizard Michael Schenker. So all your Schenker fans out here, out there, you're probably going to want to check that out. Okay, hope to see you then. Part three coming up. See ya.